Living in America used to be a dream For so many people far away and unseen With their big cars and movie stars Living in America now hail to the red, white and blue Living in America was a dream In this land they tell you to reach for anything you want And everything is possible, just believe that you can Cause we're God's chosen children Living in America with that long house and my picket fences Living in America Hi, everybody. This is Richard Sachs, your host for Lost Arts Radio. We're broadcasting worldwide our show for October 1st of 2017. And we have a really interesting and and fun show to do tonight with our friend and returning guest, Al Whitney, who has the uh, website anticorruptionsociety.com that I recommend everybody take a look at and uh, take advantage of the extensive educational material there that I think you'll you'll get a lot out of. I'm going through it myself and uh, periodically updating there as well. And part of the reason that made me think of having Al back at this particular time, though we've had a number of listener requests for her to please come back and continue from our uh, discussion last time, is that there are a number of legal, or you might say more specifically lawful approaches that are being tried to try to overcome some of the assaults against humanity that are all going on in parallel right now at the hands of the uh, rulers of government and top-level corporation positions of power. Uh, one of those is recently started uh, by the guy who did the great uh, movie Take Back Your Power, Josh Del Sol, and he's connected with a man named Cal Washington in there trying to use an administrative procedure called notice of liability to stop the smart meters. And if it works on that, which it looks like it might initially, then they could use it on a bunch of other things, you know, vaccines without informed consent and uh, chemtrails and all kinds of stuff. So I wanted to get Al's opinion on that because she's a really experienced legal researcher and has put a lot of these dots together in her own research. Um, to see what she thinks are the possibilities along that line, and then also get into uh, the basics of what's called UCC law, commercial law, uh, so that people might understand what it's all about, because all these guys are talking about that as the fundamental basis of what they're trying to do. So, welcome back, Alan. I really appreciate your being with us. Well, thanks. Um, I'm happy to be here, Richard. I mean... uh it's it's good that we're able to let the public know a little bit more about the legal system, which is around everywhere. <laughs> mm-hmm. and yeah, and al- almost nobody knows how it works, really. I mean, if you get a traffic ticket, what people know is you have to go and give them money and say yeah. you're really sorry, and you won't. You'll really try and be a better person now, and things like that's about the extent of the average knowledge of the legal system. Just living in uh, some degree of fear of it that it won't catch you for something you don't even know you did. So it's not a good situation. It was originally, as I understand it, supposed to be used not just by lawyers, but by everybody. Is that accurate? Well, yeah. And um, people need to see this wonderful, wonderful short video called Don't Talk to the Police. I don't know if you've seen it. But it is probably did a number of years ago. I think it was great, if I remember right. Yeah, and it's done by an attorney, and he he starts out explaining how many statutes there are out there, thousands of them, and um, we don't even know what they are, so we are in kind of a perilous position. You could end up violating a statute that, or what they call a law, that you didn't even know was in effect. Right, so, and it, so- it sounds really suspicious. Don't talk to the police. Well, you know, I'm. most of us are not bank robbers or anything, and we've been brought up and trained that if the police want to know when you do your laundry, you tell them immediately because it's for some really good cause. So why would you ever not talk to the police? 
Well, that's why I think I'm, it's important that all of your listeners or all the people who hear this take the time to go on online and do a search. Type in YouTube, don't talk to police, okay. and until you find this gentleman, this attorney, and he will explain exactly why you can't talk to the police. Um, and it's mainly because they can and do use anything you say against you. As innocent as the conversation may start out, and he explains it beautifully, and he does so in a very entertaining way, by you providing them information, that information can be sort of corrupted and used against you. Yes, yeah, so, so what happened? Because the police were supposed to be there only to protect us from bad people, right? Yeah, they used to be, we used to think of them as peace officers. Yeah, I remember that. Now they're rule enforcers and revenue collectors, and um, they're yeah. out there to find fault with you so they can fine you and uh, guarantee revenue for whoever they work for, be it the state or the sheriff or the municipality. Right. So it doesn't mean that the people who sign up are bad because people might get into the police for very good reasons and then they get told what they have to do. Right. Yes. After that. Yes. And there have been reports that come in that that indicate the police are told they have a quota of tickets to reach right. each month. Right. And they will go out and they will find people um, as many as they need. They'll find them and give them citations. And that's just what they're called upon to do today to keep their jobs. Yeah, I mean, it is a job for a for-profit company, which they're working for a company that calls itself usually a city or a county or a state or something like that. But what it really is, and this gets into the whole arena of language being, you know, I'm trying to say a lot of things at once here. What, what I mean to focus on is that people use language assuming they know what words mean, but so when they hear something like the city, you get the picture of the city that you live in literally being the entity that is telling the police and everybody what to do. But in reality, it's now a comp- an incorporated company using the name of the city or the county or the state. And it's got certain people who run it and others who are employed by it. Or they're all employees, I guess. And they do whatever is profitable and advantageous to that company. Is right. that accurate? Um, that's very well put. Okay. Um, that, that's what's going on right here in my municipality. Um, and they have rules. You can go to their meetings. They have open meetings, city council meetings, county commissioner meetings. But they have rules. And generally across the country, you're allowed three minutes to speak. I, I remember that. Yeah, I was one of those people recently. Yes, you're allowed three minutes to speak. And generally, the attorney for this city or the county have told them not to comment on anything that is said in public. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I just watched that happen. Yes. And therefore, they're, they don't want them to admit to anything. They don't want them to deny anything. In public, they want them to just keep their mouth shut. And when there's a, a impertinent, an important question, someone in the audience or who lives in the community asks an important question, generally they'll be told, well, we're not going to take up the, the meeting time answering that. Contact me at my office later. And that That's way... That's exactly what they say, yeah. Yes, that way... One person can ask the question, and they can control the answer, and they can control the information. And yeah. no one else will be a witness to what was said, it, particularly if it's on an issue that would be important for everyone. They don't want, they want to disseminate as little knowledge, as little information as they can get by with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's working really well. We, I was just, this meeting that I mentioned that I was at was about the 5G system and putting uh, microwave tra- or millimeter wave transmitters outside people's windows now for their own good, of course, and for better internet access and it, you know the health effects you're not supposed to pay any attention to. And people were coming to the microphone for their three minutes from the city and saying, 
this is terrible. I moved here because, you know, this didn't exist in this area, and now I'm going to have to sell my house. But I have to tell them in full disclosure that you're 20 feet away from a radiation device, and, you know, we hope that you'll buy it anyway. It's not going to work. And they were just going crazy, Say, what do you think about this? And they, they were just saying, you know, no comment. Next. And the lady wasn't even through with what her comments were, and they just made her stop because three minutes was over. It was there incredible. you go. Yeah. yeah, and they run they run school board meetings the same way. Okay. Um, okay. This is the new model for this corporate structure. Uh, they are they are employees of these entities in my state. Um, they incorporated the school board. I believe it was in 1953. I found the statute that did it, mm-hmm. and um, along with the statute that describes their corporation and the rules about their corporation, both the school board and the municipality and the county, come um, these guidelines about how to deal with the public. So you'll see it's uniform. Yeah, it's amazing. Well, it's working, I guess. So they figure they should do it everywhere. But yeah. it's, it's got a com- many common themes. One of the ones I was just trying to describe is that when you think, what is the city? Well, it to me... Logically, the city is the land and the people that live on it, you know, maybe the, some of the activities and buildings and stuff that happen on it. It's not a little group of rulers. It's the whole whole group of people, it seems to me. Yeah, and that's where we're wrong because, see, what we're doing when we go to vote for city council or county commissioner, it's no different than um, if you're a member of the Sierra Club, they have – executives they have a board that gets elected by the membership so if you have any stock you can vote right if you're a member they send you a proxy you can vote now what you find out very quickly is whoever wins that election even if it's your friend does not work for you right right they work for the sierra club the same thing's true with the city when you when you vote for a a city council member um, because you're a voter, you're allowed the privilege of helping to select who sits on city council. Once they are put in office, however, they don't work for the constituents. They work for the city. They become city employees. Well, if they're the directors, who do they work for? Who's the city? The city is a corporation. Right, but who tells the board of directors what to do? Well, in most cases... You have, like, the county commissioners, okay? Okay. Now, in my municipality and a lot of municipalities, they have a general manager. And truly, the general manager is full-time and is basically in charge. So, in a city, would the general manager tell the city council people what to do? Um, yeah, they could. And they could say, you can do this and you can't do that. And, um, yeah, they could. Okay. Um, that's the ones who signs the checks. Basically, what they do is they get involved in borrowing money mm-hmm. and getting grant contracts. They sign contracts. They sign the municipality into contractual agreements and grants and loans. And those documents control what's done. I think a lot of people are familiar with the fact that we've got SWAT teams all over the country now. Yeah. And that was not done by the voters. The voters were never called upon to vote. Do you want a SWAT team in your community? Mm -hmm. Those were decisions that were made by city council, county commissioner, etc. When the grants were offered to them, from higher levels of government, right? Like the state or the federal government. Correct. The, okay. the offer is made, and it'll say right on it, this is a grant contract. All the terms and the conditions of the grant are there in the contract. Generally, two people have to sign it. Okay, now that obligates them to that contract. This is why people need to understand, this is not what you call a representative government. This is what you call a corporate government. And it's being controlled by other corporations above it, basically. That's correct. Now, in the case of my municipality, we found a letter um, that was from the city treasurer 
it was a response to someone's request where he reminded the city that at a private retreat, they had all voted to accept as many loans and and grants as they could that would benefit the city. Now, that was done without any of the people who call this place home. We had no knowledge of that. And some of these grants that come in are part of Agenda 21. So we wake up one day and our roads are changed. We now have roundabouts that we didn't need. Um, We have now five-story buildings that we never had before. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we, we question what is going on. And because most of the people who call my town home don't understand what I'm telling you, they're always upset. They're having meetings. They go to city council and complain. They mm-hmm. get they sign petitions. Mm-hmm. Um, they try to use the method methods of activism, which they're told are the appropriate way to deal with this. But they still don't understand that it's a government corporation. In fact, I went to one meeting and I I tried to explain to the people who attended, almost all of these activist meetings have an attorney present, and that's your gatekeeper, because I tried to explain, well, the reason the city council doesn't do what you say is this is a a corporation, Mm -hmm. and he he said that's unimportant, and he um, changed the topic and wouldn't let me speak. Wow, amazing. And... Absolutely shut me up. Wow. And that's unimportant to me. So you've got gatekeepers that, that are called attorneys that will continually confuse the public about what this structure of government is. I even had a lawyer email me and said, well, I don't know if you're right or wrong about it being a corporation, but it doesn't matter either way. Well, it certainly does matter. Either Who way. was it that said that he doesn't know if it's a corporation, some kind of an attorney connected to the city? No, this was an attorney who was a friend of a friend. This the 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 gentleman that I knew had gotten in trouble with traffic tickets, uh-huh. and I was asked to give him some information. And it turns out he went to college with with a bar attorney. Okay. So he brought in his bar attorney, and we had like this three way discussion, and it was really quite interesting. I. Uh, sent him information and he he sent me information it doesn't matter it doesn't matter um whether it's a corporation or not it's unimportant <laughs> <laughs> and, that's a really amazing answer i mean and that's what they'll tell you if you, they won't deny it a lot of them won't deny it but they'll just say well so what it doesn't matter um okay, now, now one of the things we've been told about corporations in the business world is that the board of directors work for the stockholders Mm-hmm. And that the stockholders can vote them in and out and uh, get rid of them at different times and stuff like that. It, the stockholders in a city are basically the people who live in it, right? Well, it's different, no, because we don't get paid anything. We have to pay. So the stockholders have to pay for, well, the stockholders are paying the salaries of the board of directors, say. In but a the city. Sto- in a corporation, the stockholders get. Um, Dividends and stuff. Dividends, right? correct. When okay. you live in the city, not only do you not get dividends, you are required to pay them taxation, taxes and fees and fines. You're you're obligated to pay them. Yeah, that is really interesting. I so mean, it, I know in our city they're being really merciful and they're only taking, I think, 11% of every transaction in tax. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> in, adi- in addition to the property tax and the school tax and everything else. Oh, my gosh, yes. Well, and see, this is how Common Core got into my state. It was a contract agreement that was signed by my governor, two people, that's all they needed. Uh-huh. Um, the governor and um, apparently my state has a um, director of education. So the director of education and the governor signed the the agreement for Common Core, and oh. then it, it's implemented um, throughout the state. And pretty much all of the schools that take federal money 
uh, all the schools are, are sucked into it. So a big part of the way this whole system works is everybody's willing to do it for free money. For exactly. Right? The representatives of the city, the county, the state, and yes. the school district, and everybody else. Yes, it's all business, and, and they maximize the profit. They are encouraged to maximize the profit of the city and mm-hmm. cut down on waste. And which, however, of, which, of course, is not called profit because it's a city that's just there for your benefit. Correct. And when we have complained to them, they have said, well, we saved the city X amount of dollars. Um, my husband said to them, well, where's our, our rebate then? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they got him off that topic real quick he said if we're saving money where's our rebate yeah the peasants aren't supposed to be allowed to say things about that I know no instead they have a new building or they have new cars over there or they have a new something whatever yeah, yeah exactly wow interesting so this whole thing of giving away money is very close to the center of what keeps it moving the, right. ex- that is exactly what keeps it moving, is that the Agenda 21 is moving throughout the country because people are accepting grant money and loans to implement it. It in, is. In other people, words, that's the contract. You get the free money, and we get to tell you what to do. Exactly. Okay. And, so, and, and anybody that says, we don't want the free money, if the citizens aren't very aware they may get voted out yeah see that as long as the citizens don't know how this works and whenever i try to explain to them how it works and invariably there's a bar attorney in the room Mm -hmm. and they will listen to the bar attorney and not me and the bar attorney will say well that's not important that's how they dismiss um those of us who are trying to get the truth out about our legal system they have two ways of doing it. One is they they claim that we're not experts, so therefore they sh- they should not listen to us. And two, it's unimportant. They're the experts, and they're just everything's going to be fine. People, what she has to say is not important. Right. And they are quite effective because most of the people in the country still have faith in bar attorneys. Well, and and we worship credentials. Yes, right? that's. I mean, that's so ingrained. People don't even think about it. But as soon as you hear that somebody is a, a certified something, you just assume that's who they are. Yes, and you see it everywhere. I mean, there's a TV show about hoarders, and I remember that people would introduce themselves. They're there to help help these men and women who have got this horrible problem. And, um, you know, one lady said, I'm a licensed organizer. And I thought, oh, my God. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Right. Right. Or I've got my certification in OCD or I got my certification in hoarding. You know, they just. Which means I don't have to think for myself anymore. I just repeat what I'm told by the people who gave me the license. Exactly. Uh, I mean, the whole license scam is another amazing brilliant actually system for controlling people it because is. if you're given a license that's a license to charge money for some supposed expertise that you have but a lot of what you think you learned you actually memorized yes and how about licensed dogs i mean i this is just right. and then to have a dog with a license you have to have him vaccinated every year yeah, yeah, exactly. I recently talked to somebody who was providing uh, raw milk, which is a really incredible superfood if you know how to produce it. And the state, uh, in our state, allows these people to function temporarily anyway. But if you want to have any animal, like a cow or a goat or anything like that, and be involved in um, getting milk from it, you have to have a license from the state, but you also have to have that animal registered. Oh, wow. Which means not only can they vaccinate it any time they want, and then the bad things that happen to it as a result can be blamed on other things. But if it gets too sick, or if they just declare that it might be sick, they can steal it. Yes. And you can't do anything. Well, yes, you you can do something, um, and you don't have to license it, but you have to... 
you have to understand how the legal system works. Right. You know, basically, Richard, what we are all doing is they're telling us we have to do these things. We just assume that they're correct. Well, and yeah, I, they have to tell the truth. They're officials. <laughs> and so we end up volunteering into this craziness. And, uh, and, a, and a lot of them that are not telling the truth think they are telling the truth, actually. Oh yeah, they're all they're they're all they they're can't not afford, in, they they wouldn't be as effective if they knew they were lying. Oh yeah, they can't afford these people who are on the front line to know the truth. They can't afford that, and they can't. They don't want them to have. They want to keep them as ignorant as as possible, so they don't screw up and say something that would mess up the system. Arrogance also helps. Yes, because if you're really proud of your status and you can't afford to have it threatened. Um, you're going to treat people accordingly. Yes, and the more they pay you, the more you will do exactly what you're told. Yeah, yeah. It's similar to doctors that have gone 150000 or $250,000 in debt to get a medical degree, yes. uh, being told to reconsider some of the things they memorized. It's unlikely. Yeah, it's true. I mean, I, I see it every day. So, the system is really run by money. The people who control money, really, he who owns the gold makes the rules. Yeah, that's, the golden rule, I've heard of that. <laughs> <laughs> that's the world reality that we are tragically stuck in at the moment. And it was laid down brick by brick by brick. They knew what they were doing. This is what they wanted. They wanted to control and own everything to enslave the population and... Uh, do what they wish with the uh, the planet's resources, and right. that's so, so. Agenda Twenty One didn't just come out of nowhere. It was a, an e expression of what you're talking about had been part of the system for a long time before that. Yes, absolutely. Okay. It did not come out of nowhere. It was. It was. You know, there's a wonderful booklet um, that. Is on my website. If you go to my website and look at Anatomy of a Con Job, it's at the top. Those like tabs at the top, Anatomy of a Con Job. And it was written by John Truman Wolf. If you go and you read, it's easy to read. It's not only easy to read, he's an enjoyable writer. I like the way he writes and he adds kind of humor in there. And, uh, you know, he's just really a good writer. He, um, studied all this he was actually a banker but for some reason john truman wolf which is not his that's that's his pseudo name that's his pen name um decided he saw what was going on and he was going to tell the truth about it and in that booklet which is fairly simple he exposes five of these cons and they're all built on each other and they all are, end up in the world of the sustainable development, okay? This is on anticorruptionsociety.com, right? Yes. Okay. Yes, and this is a, an easy-to-read booklet. It's free. John gave permission for us to uh, distribute it. I, we mm -hmm. had him, I had him on my show. I have a show on Saturday night the same time your show is on, and he was a guest, and he was delightful. How can people listen to your show? What's the best well, they can't because it. they got to listen to yours. But they, <laughs> <laughs> they can go to my archives. I mean, yeah. if they go to um, my website, anticorruptionsociety.com, there is a little banner for RBN, the programs on RBN. Okay. If they click on that, they'll get to my program, and then they can look at archives when they're not listening to you. Okay. And, uh, and that's I, Saturday nights once a week? Saturday nights. Um, okay. Eight to ten Eastern, and I think that's the same time you're on, isn't it? Eastern. Um, it's almost. It's a little off. Ours is um, nine to twelve Eastern, so it's one hour uh, skewed a little bit. But okay. Um, and and the only thing about the archive thing with our show is that our Saturday night show is live callers. Okay. So so they may have to be there for that, but it'd be great if they all listen to the archives on that are available on your site, right? Which which tab has your radio show archives? Um okay, if you go to IDH program 
links on anti-corruption society. There's a, a tab at the top that says IDH program links, and that's in Defense of Humanity, which is the name mm -hmm. of the show. Then you can scroll down and you'll see there'll be a link to the archives, but you'll also see the topics that were discussed and people may find, you know, pick and choose what topic they might want to listen to because we, we try to list them every week. Okay, perfect. So, so um, what I was going to bring up is that this, this system based on the idea of controlling everybody, taking free money, which the government has made a deal with a private group of criminals known as the central bank or the Federal Reserve to print right. money out of nothing, just right. these pieces of paper that they say, okay, this is money, and we get to buy everything with this fake money, and therefore we use it to control the country, and we combine that with the fraudulent legal system and all these private corporations essentially calling themselves cities and counties and states subservient to the federal network of combat or of corporations and yes. instead of seeing it as impossible to deal with some you know in just an inevitable slavery situation some people have done a lot of the legal research and said well all these corporations their weak point is that they're corporations and so they're all um you know in connected to what's called UCC law and if you understand that you can do things that they don't want you to know you can do so is is that true and if so what is UCC law well yeah they're all they're all corporations and people don't often think about this but this if you think a little bit about it it makes sense they're all bound by the laws of contract corporations contract with each other right mm -hmm. that's how they do business they don't generally Rarely do they ever, because they're fictions, you know, they're just... Yeah, you don't see two corporations on the street shaking hands after a conversation or something. That's correct. What they're gonna do. Okay. If they come up with a deal, you bet your bippy that it will be followed up by words on a piece of paper and people will be signing a contract. Mm -hmm. um, so, they're all bound by the laws of contract, period. And that has to do with how we deal with them and how they deal with each other. Everybody needs to really get that in their head. They're all bound by the laws of contract. Corporations can't function any other way. And that's been going on for a very, very, very long time. So, um, once people accept, okay, they're all bound by laws of contract, then you say to yourself, well, what are the laws of contract? Now you're, you're getting into the Uniform Commercial Code, which is a private international law used for commerce okay now they essentially think of everything they do as commerce from production to consumption in their world it's all commerce it's all about it's all under the control of the uniform commercial code right and the and the word commercial means pertaining to commerce right yes exactly Okay. And the way they got in, got this system put in place is they, they uh, fool the public and they say all of this is constitutional. Um, and then they say, Judge Napolitano brought that up publicly, which I was thrilled to hear him say. He said about Obamacare, yeah, they say it's constitutional. He said they slip everything in under the Commerce Clause of the Constitution. Okay. Okay, now let's look at what is the Commerce Clause of the Constitution for a minute. Make sure we understand that. Okay, hold on. I had that booklet out. If I don't have it out, I can get it fairly fast. It's in, um, uh, hold on. I've got two computers here. I'll, I'll, I'll get it in a second because it's kind of important people understand that this whole thing is functioning under commerce. Yeah, so I, I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I, I just thought we shouldn't just let anything slip by that's a really important word that everybody assumes they know, but they don't really know. Yes, so I'm going to get this for you. Um, we have on our website how the legal, it's basics about how the legal system works. Again, if you go back to the anticorruptionsociety.com, one of the, the tabs at the top is Notice of Condition Precedent. Click on that and you will see a picture come up with a, a 
an elderly woman and man on the left. Underneath that picture, it says this is a man and a woman. And on the right, you'll see a stick man, and it says this is a person. The name of the booklet is um, Are You Legally Alive or Dead? And in this little booklet, which is only 24 pages, it's pretty easy to read, I think. Mm -hmm. Um, We explain kind of what I'm telling you right now about how the legal system works and um, the Uniform Commercial Code. And I'm going right now to the page that I put in there about commerce. I added that in the latest edition because I went and I found a wonderful definition on Wikipedia. Normally, I don't use Wikipedia because uh, I think the powers that be kind of control it. They censor it. Mm -hmm. Well, Wikipedia can be edited by basically anybody, right? Yeah, but they they correct anything that they don't like. I found that out. Well, that's what I mean is they'd be the main editors. Yeah, (laughs) they do. With unlimited resources to do that. Yes, they have people watching it all the time, and they take down anything that doesn't suit their purpose. Okay. Yeah. Um, The Commerce Clause describes an enumerated power listed in the United States Constitution, Article 1, Section 8, Clause 3. The clause states that the United States Congress shall have power to regulate commerce with foreign nations and among the several states and with the Indian tribes. So, they are referring to interstate commerce. Commerce that goes from one state to another. Yeah, now, because it says among the states, not within the states, right? Exactly. Now, on that Wikipedia site, you're going to love this definition of commerce. Commerce is a term which means all the activities which start from production and end at consumption. The system includes legal, economic, political, social, cultural, and technological systems that are in operation in any, in any country or internationally. So they're saying it means the go- federal government can control anything. Yes, because they just call it commerce. And that's why we have all these six, thousands of statutes, etc. They're all about commerce, but the good news for us is when you see that, You understand they're all in commerce. You understand that uh, it's all contract law. Then you start to question and say, okay, um, did I sign a contract on this? What did I sign? Mm -hmm. And that's where the kicker is, is that we're signing contracts, agreements, forms. All the time, we are actually volunteering into this jurisdiction and don't know it. So, what's an example of us doing that? Oh, I'll give an example of one that I declined. Okay. <laughs> Recently, okay. Uh, I got a notice from um, the city animal control telling me um, that they wanted me to apply for a dog license for my dog. Okay, okay. And on and it, they basically told you that you have to, right? They told me I had to apply. Okay. And I didn't respond. Then they sent me another letter saying that I didn't reply in the time that that they wanted. So now, to get this dog license, I would have to pay a hundred dollars more as a as a fine. Right, to be punished for not being to a be good punished. citizen. Yeah. But now people they don't get that that's an application. It says right on there, I'm applying. Now. That's not, they didn't send me a bill for a dog tax. They they offered me the opportunity to apply. Okay, okay. And I did not apply. And I haven't heard from them for many, many, many months. Now, to be totally safe, when somebody sends you an offer like we're letting you apply for a dog license, if yeah. you don't, if you don't respond... Is that some kind of understood agreement because you didn't say anything? I, I don't know that you could say that because it's an application. Okay, okay. It's not a bill. It's not like when they send you your real estate tax. That's something. Okay. 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 This okay. is an application. 
<laughs> it's a voluntary opportunity that if you would like all the uh, benefits and privileges and honors of having a dog license, then you have the opportunity to get one. That's right. Okay. So now if they would give me a real hard time and send me another letter, I would say, look, I appreciate that. Uh, please send me a signed contract that you have with my name on it that obligates me to do this. Thank you so much. Okay, and now the same the same part. thing could be could be brought up with the respect to any kind of a statute that the city council would pass. Exactly. It? Because you don't have a contract about any of those things, as far as I know. Exactly. Now they've they've just declared that they're in charge of you. If you've got a license with the city, and I have a friend who ha- had this situation, you've got a license with the city, and they want you to renew the license. Now, she she asked me, she said, well, do I have to? And I said, well, look at your previous license. Did you ever agree to do this every year? She said, no, they send me one every year. And I said, well, then send them a copy back and thank them for the offer. And ask them what obligates you to apply for this license Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. within that city. What obligates you to apply for this business license? So the city doesn't pass a law or a statute or what do they call a city law? Uh, Ordinance. Yeah, an ordinance that says, all right, everybody has to have a license now. Do, Do they pass a rule like that? They do, but they do it in legalese. In other words, they do it like saying... Well, for instance, the the application for the dog, they I was supposed to sign as the owner, caretaker, or harbinger of the animal. All those three words were capitalized at the first. Owner with a capital O, caretaker with a capital C, harbinger with a capital H. And when you see that, you know that that's their legal terms. That yeah. means... I'm agreeing to wear that hat by yes. signing my name. Right. Now, I and I do own a dog. I don't think of myself as an owner capital O. And gosh, yeah, no, because that's like almost like a proper name of somebody, right? Exactly. So I am not This is a, such a subtle point. I mean, I'm hoping that we're getting this across. Because the difference between owner with a small O and owner with a big O, they're completely different meanings. One is a proper noun and one is not. Yeah, one is just describing an activity that you're owning the dog and that, that's something that's true about you. Right. The, the other one is almost like giving you a station in some way. Yeah, exactly. That's what, People need to understand that in their system, it, you're not a who, you're a what. In right. our world, you're a you're a who you're you're Richard. Um, I I see your picture. I hear your voice. You know, mm-hmm. I know you're a, a living man, un- unless you're a well disguised alien. Um, <laughs> yeah, no. As far as I know, I mean, I haven't. <coughs> Terminator did ripped open my arm to see if there's cables in there. As far as <laughs> okay. I know, I'm more or less human. Right, but in their world, they don't deal with. The human, they deal with, um, you know, let's give you a, a, an owner. Uh, let's presume you have an animal. Yeah. Okay, in their world, you're the owner or the person. That's a big one in theirs. Or the individual or the agent or Which the guardian. Which everybody thinks they know what person means, so they don't worry about it. Or the parent or guardian, both with capital letters, capital P, capital G. Right. Okay, in their world, it's a what. They deal with what's. They don't deal with who's. And that's kind of important for people to understand. Because remember, this is a corporation. They right. cannot own a flesh and blood. It's a fiction. And people have such a hard time with that. Yeah. A fiction cannot own a living thing. Because it's not real. The fiction in this case being the corporation called a city, for example. Right, all corporations. I don't care whether they be nonprofit, profit, trusts, corporations. All these legal, they're legal entities. They're artificially created legal entities. Now, if slavery were legal in the U.S., could a corporation own a slave? 
they could own something with a capital S. If they gave it a definition, they'd have to define what a slave was. Okay. And then they'd have to make rules about the slave. And okay. then they would be turning the slave into a, um, a, a what, not a okay. who. Not Possession. A who. Yeah. So, if you don't put the capital S on the slave, then the slave remains a person and you can't own it. That's what you're saying, I think. Well, they can't own, it's even different than that. They can't own living. They can't own anything living, whether, whether it be a man, a woman, if they call it a small s slave, they still can't own living beings because they're a fiction. Um, they're not real. The only, the only way ownership can take place is if something real like you owns a cat. That's something else real, or you own a book. That's something what, else real. What about if the cat is a horse or a cow, for example, an agricultural animal, and it's owned by an incorporated farm? Is that legal? Yes, because then that is considered um, a resource. Then the, the animals are named as resources. Okay. And the corporation owns the resources. Okay. Now, pretty much they make legal what they want legal. So, it's important for people to understand the, the key here, more so than anything else, is, is how the flesh and blood living men and women with spirits and humor and voices and the ability to dance and all of right make things up create we are in a whole different category than a legal fiction mm -hmm. <coughs> but we have to understand that's what we're dealing with we're not dealing <coughs> with anything real we're dealing with a bunch of people who work for this charter which is nothing more than a bunch of words on a piece of paper in a safe somewhere. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really just a business model. That's all it is, is a business model. So, UCC, is that the body of written uh, rules that control that whole game about how to do business with contracts and yes. everything commercial? Yes, and that is, and, and I, I think I mentioned this to you in our conversation earlier, my husband went to the senior citizen discussion group and there were several men and women who were running for office for municipal judge and the courts that they would be serving would be family court, traffic court, um, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And he asked them what jurist, what kind of law is practiced in those courts that they were running for office for. And they all said the uniform commercial code. Hmm. They had no problem saying that because they, they're they so familiar with it. I, If you're in the court system, you're really familiar with it. Um, I think they, what can I say? They think everybody understands this, I guess. Are, are you aware whether or not they actually teach Uniform Commercial Code in law school now? Yeah, they do. Of course they, they do. do. It's, a, okay. it's the law of contracts. Okay, okay. Where, where we run into difficulty is the lawyers are taught something about the Constitution. The lawyers are not taught that the Constitution has been suspended since 1933 when they brought in the Banking Act and they stole the people's gold and all of that. Mm -hmm. and, the, and supposedly the country went bankrupt. The lawyers aren't told that. Most lawyers don't even know about that. And if they know about that, they keep it to themselves. Are, so, they taught, are they taught statutes in addition to UCC law? UCC law is statutes. They're taught statutory law. That's what they're taught, statutory law. Okay, so the, the list of laws that are made by cities and counties and states, you're yes. saying those, those are all included under UCC law? Oh, yeah. Okay. Absolutely. In uh, fact... Uh, there's a committee in each state when legislators get together and they they want to pass a bill, let's just say they they want to change the public health laws like they did in California to eliminate uh, exemptions. 
okay. from vaccines for vaccines. Right. Now, you've got the legislators that are elected by the public, and they are not all trained in law. A lot of them are lawyers, but not all of them. So when they sit down and they get ready to write this legislation, there is a group of lawyers in every state that makes sure that the, the words are caref- carefully selected and framed to be compatible with the definitions in the UCC. Mm-hmm. Okay. Now, the, the, the legislators, you know, the little guy I know down the street, he wouldn't know how to do that. No, I don't think most of the legislators write laws at all. They, no, they might can't. put in, they want some kind of an idea put into law, but the people right. who are the specialists, like you just described, are not the elected officials. That's correct. And so, the legislators are told one thing. But the lawyers make sure that everything is UCC compatible. Mm-hmm. And that's why in, in once you get past these veils, though, and you see the game and how it's being played, um, that's not what they want us to understand. Because it is in looking at the truth of this that you can start to see uh, solutions like uh, Cal Washington attempts is attempting to do on the smart meter issue yeah and and i think it's important to say too this is not something for people to take lightly and just start charging in here and doing all kinds of things that they may do incompletely or incorrectly this is this is um something that you can do non-violently as a form of self-defense yes right? that's, that's really what it comes down to that is what it comes down to it will not it will not fix the big picture. I mean, uh, when I got into this, I told everybody I was going to stay on the bottom rung of this ladder. I wasn't going to specialize in court battles. I wasn't going to specialize in avoiding taxes. I was going to stay on the bottom and help people understand how it is that they are volunteering themselves into a system that is not in their best interest. Mm-hmm. And that's what I have pretty much done is help people understand the game is commercial law, law merchant. That's the game. You are signing up for this game because you don't understand it and you're, no one's telling you the truth about it. Um, once you understand that it's all uniform commercial code, you can start reading about that and you'll get a much better picture about what is going on in these courtrooms. And the only right that they have left you, okay, because it's all commerce and you're signing up, uh, they've given you the right to rebut presumptions because there's a lot of them out there to give notices and that's what Cal Washington was doing. Mm-hmm. That's in Uniform Commercial Code. Um, so that little booklet that I told you about, which isn't that long, I think it's 24 half pages, that can help people get started understanding how how it works. Is that the one that you told me was somewhere around 10 pages or something? Or is um, that something different? That's something different. Now, if people want to know more, They can go and look at the general provisions of the Uniform Commercial Code, UCC-General Provisions. Now, that's on my website under um, Source Documents. Just scroll down. I think that's around 10 pages. And that is the basics of the UCC. It gets a lot more complicated, but that's your basics. And you can see that is the basics of statutory law. Right. Let me just ask you, where, just so that we have some context for what we're talking about, where did UCC come from? Has it been, was there an original, you know, foundational group of writings that then got added to or changed, or how did that work? What's their origin? Bar, okay, the American Bar Association is a branch of the London Bar Guild, for those who aren't familiar with it. And... Um, when they, they've been working on this country for a very long time, they wanted all the, all the, the laws to be law merchant, right? Because these are the merchants, okay? okay. So okay. they wanted to ensure that, that they could 
guarantee they'd get paid for bringing their goods in and that people would honor contracts with them. So ultimately, what they wanted, and this is coming from the international banksters, the London Bar Guild, they needed contract law to be superior to any other form of law. And that's how attorney Melvin Stamper put it in his book, Fruit from a Poisonous Tree. They needed contract law to be superior to any other form of law. So that if they could trick you into signing the contract, that would be the enforceable agreement. And they needed that. They needed they need government officials to sign contracts so they can force them on enforce them against them. Um, they needed the people to sign contracts. Mortgages was like the number one, so they could enforce it against you. And your constitution would never enter into it because you voluntarily signed that mortgage. Right. So you agreed to their terms and conditions. And when you did so, you didn't think twice about the Constitution. You just thought about the house you were buying. So this UCC body of rules is not ancient or anything. You're talking about it's, you know, being in recent Western civilization, pretty much, right? No, I, I, it has been around a long time. Again, these, they have always had laws about commerce. Because they, these ships have been floating back and forth across the ocean, and they've been doing business here, there, and everywhere. Mm-hmm. And uh, granted, there were always pirates on the seas. Some people call the banksters the big pirates on the sea. But um, th- these these rules have been around a very, very long time. It's just mm-hmm. they've now applying them to things that customarily they wouldn't be applied to. For instance, the relationship with. Um, mother, father, child, and the school. Yeah, I mean, you wouldn't expect the law merchant to be there, but it is today. So, I guess what I'm getting at is: is there one set of writings or group of books or something that is the official total UCC? Yeah, it's huge. It's gotten huge. A friend of mine went and got. I think what did she say? The year was 1961. They swept across the country in the 50s and 60s and got the different states. Got the states to. Um, Institute UCC, okay? Okay. By the end, like mid or end of the 60s, it was pretty much a done deal. And that was done by a group of bar attorneys who were working on that and implementing. They wanted all these laws uniform between the states, uniform, uniform. So they they managed to get that done. In uh, Ohio, it was completed, I believe, in 1953. Florida, 1954. I mean, each state probably has a different date when the courts changed. And all of a sudden, the statutes were UCC, and the courts were enforcing statutory law. So that is the the basic law library that everything else is just commentary on or implications of, is those books that define UCC, right? Uh Like an Encyclopedia Britannica or something, except it's all UCC. Yeah, and I don't know that it's books. I think the last time I saw it was one great big fat book, but they keep okay. they keep adding it because it's all about finances, right? It's all about liens and leases and mortgages, and it's all about money. There's and it's no, got its own language, right? It does, and the word happiness is nowhere in the whole book. Right, but even if it were, it wouldn't mean happiness. I mean, they've got words that you think you know what they mean, and they're all redefined. Exactly. So, if you understand the language, which looks like English, yeah. but it has all these different definitions, and if you understand the way it works, then the idea is it's harder for you to become a complete victim of it. Correct. But the thing of it is, you you need to stay out of the court jurisdiction because in their courts, it's all statutory law, in their courts, you are in there. Even though you walk in on your own power, you know you're a living man. You knew that when you woke up in the morning and you knew it when you walked into that courtroom. That courtroom cannot see you, Richard. Let's just say this is about the dog license or something. Yeah. 
Yeah. That court, or how about a driver's license? That court sees you as driver with a capital D. It does not see you as the flesh and blood living Richard. It, As Melvin Stamper put it, he said, these courts aren't really about the judges. They're not really about the courtrooms. What is court in the United States today is the paperwork. That's what's going on. So if you have ever w- gone in and watched courts, you will see when the case comes up, the judge sits there and stares at this, fo- this file folder of papers in front of him. I've seen that even in traffic court. That's what they do. That's what they do. And what they're doing is they're seeing if they've got, they are the trier of the facts. Okay, the trier of the facts will look at the paperwork he has to see if he's got all the necessary paperwork to make a, a conclusion. Mm-hmm. Doesn't necessarily care what you say, although wants you to plead, okay, um, and wants you to admit that you are that, that name. But in actuality, what he's looking at is the paperwork. Okay. And if the paperwork doesn't indicate that that you restricted your signature or you wrote under duress or you somehow put on your paper something other than just a signature, the presumption is that you agreed to all of it. You agreed to abide by all the rules. You agreed to whatever the judge says um, because he's looking at the paperwork. So, an example, since you're mentioning signature, is you get stopped for supposedly going faster than the speed limit. And they always, the police person that stops you is going to want you to sign the ticket and saying, this doesn't obligate you to anything and it just, uh, it don't, don't worry about it, it doesn't mean anything, I just need you to sign it. And so, that would be the thing that they have your signature on in the case of a traffic stop. Yes, you signed yourself into their jurisdiction. Yeah, okay, and so there, there's a way in UCC law where you can make a signature so that it doesn't do that, right? Yes, you sign without prejudice above your name. You don't need to cite a certain number or letter of a clause or anything like that? Well, you could sign without prejudice UCC 1-308, um, but you can get by with just signing without prejudice above your name. Now, what does that do? That brings in your rights. That brings in, it brings you back into an arena that actually offers you some relief in this mess. Um, because what you were saying, I'm looking, I just had it earlier today on my desk. Um, you're saying that you're going to accept you're accepting, um, but you're reserving all rights. And that's in UCC. There is a UCC provision, 1-308. People can look it up. Just type in, in your search. UCC 1-308 and hit enter. And you will get to that, that section of reserving your rights. Now, UCC gave us that. Because without giving us that, Everything would be coercion. Now, they weren't obligated to tell us this. We're going to have to share the information with each other. But without giving you that opportunity to reserve your rights, it would all be coercion. And if you're coercing people to sign contracts, in theory, that makes the contracts null or void. It has to always look like it was a meeting of the minds, right? Two people agreed, meeting of the minds. You agreed to this jurisdiction. You agreed to follow our rules. Look at this. Did you sign this? A judge will frequently ask in a courtroom, did you sign this? Is this your signature? Because uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. that's what he's looking for. He's looking for documentation that you agreed. That you volunteered. What about things you're charged for that you'd never signed anything for? Like what? Well, let's say they pass a law that 
you every on Thursday every adult has to be vaccinated with whatever toxic mess they have ready to vaccinate you with and you don't go and they arrest you because you didn't get your vaccine according to the law um remember there's always going to be some kind of a joiner uh, I'm trying to think you're saying that they could pass a law that says everybody I don't know that they could do that um, because for, well, first of all they would define who everybody is part of the UCC is they have to define it mm-hmm. so they would define it as you know you'll never see in their in their terminology everybody it's not in UCC okay would they just add it as a condition to something they think you already signed? Um, well, they would say all persons okay. um, taking public transport or all persons employed in such and such or all persons, they, they always have to define who it applies to. Okay. So generally, they're going to use the word persons. Or individuals, um, and when they use the word persons, they're not talking about the flesh and blood, Richard. They're talking about the legal fiction that they create from your birth certificate, whereby they change and alter your name from all cap R and small letters, Richard, to all caps, Richard. Right, that's right. when they create, that's the legal person that all of these laws apply to. And the sad thing is we don't know that, so we volunteer into their rules, into their jurisdiction. And um, we we show up and they say, well, here he is. I'm going to put him in jail, you know. Right. He, he When you walk into their courtroom, you have volunteered into their jurisdiction. Okay, so, but if you don't, show up at the courtroom at the time that you're supposed to show up in a courtroom, then you get a warrant for your arrest, right? Well, that's why it, it, on our website, we have a, um, a booklet. It's a, it's a guide. It's the People's Empowerment Guide to Our Corporate Legal Structure. And it's called Lawfully Yours. Okay. Okay, and it, I think it's maybe 66 pages now, and you don't have to read it all, but there's different sections, and we try to explain how this system works. And we try to explain that this, this county or this city that's issuing you a ticket is a corporation, mm-hmm. and that ticket is an invitation. And um, particularly if you signed it, you know, you without mm-hmm. restricting your signature, then you are, it's going to be more difficult for you to go forward. But you can say, I don't wish to contract with this municipal corporation by returning the summons and saying, um, no contract, uh, I don't agree to these procedures. And you send it back within three days. So, right. again, it's the paperwork that is the court. Okay, so so what what happens if you do that and they just arrest you anyway and say, we don't care? Well, if they arrest you anyway, you have to make sure that when you, if you're brought into court that you don't agree to be the legal fiction person. You know, you're saying that's not me. Um, I'm a living flesh and blood man. That is the name on this birth certificate. That is the name on a birth certificate, but that is not me. Right. Now, it becomes a lot stickier depending. Remember, we've got judges, and I, on my website, um, on that page I was telling you about um, notice of condition precedent. If you scroll down, you can listen to a Florida judge who has a man in in. The man's in jail, and they're doing a hearing whether or not the judge will set bail. And the conversation between the judge and the man is what's so very interesting, because the judge, you can tell, needs to get the living flesh and blood man to agree to be the person. And by agreeing, I don't mean 
saying the words I agree. What they think of an agreement is when they make a statement and you don't object. (laughs) So he says, well, we've got um, person so-and-so here who's violated the, the rules for the state of Delaware's traffic something or other. Now, at that point, the individual, the living man, needs to say, I object, I am not a legal person. I am a flesh and blood man. Now, the judges know this. Trust me, they know this, and they do not like that. So that's why we try to get people to do their paperwork beforehand and avoid court if they can. Yeah, because otherwise the judges, what does the judge do to try to force you to admit that, the wrong thing? Oh, they go on and on. I mean, it's just, if you listen to that, you will see how far this judge was willing to go to trick this man (laughs) into accepting the, to being a what? Okay. I mean, really, these judges... Now, he had, the judge had forewarning because this was the second time the man appeared in front of court, so the judge knew what his argument was going to be, mm-hmm. so he got prepared. And you, what you're hearing is the judge who knows the argument, and he is um, using his, his trickery to trick the man into not objecting to being a what. And so, he actually succeeded, he wore him out. Most judges come from the ranks of attorneys, right? Although there can be exceptions. Yes. And at what point, is it at the very beginning when they're being considered to be named as a judge that they're told that this is all a complete scam and you just have to do it and you're going to get all these benefits for playing along with it? Or do they learn about that before they ever try to be a judge? No, they don't know. They're 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 much like doctors and vaccinations. Okay. They are just told what the rules are and what paperwork they need to have done, and um, so they don't realize the extent to which they're perpetrating a scam. Correct. Most of them. Correct. All right. Mm-hmm. In fact, you know, Melvin Stamper, one of the people, a judge who endorsed his book, um, thought it was astounding, and a former pr- assistant prosecutor wrote in the foreword of the book that he um, was around in Florida when they changed the courts to UCC in 1954, that as a prosecutor, they were never told why the rules were changing. They were just saying it was more efficient, we've got new rules, and here's the new rules. That was it. And he had no idea all those years until he read Stamper's book in 2008 what actually took place in 1954 in Florida. So and the average judge is just thinking that the... the um, they're just following the, the rules. They're following the rules and they're thinking that the person who comes in with these arguments is just making their job much harder for no reason. And so they're actually trying to trick him into compliance just because they want the system to work smoothly, not because they're nefarious. Yeah, um... They're told all kinds of things, you know. They, I've heard, I've heard. Uh, I don't know if you've heard of um, David Morton. What's his name? Sean David Morton. I don't think so. He's been okay. Well, he's been involved in this for a long time, trying to find a remedy, you know. And he was on Project Camelot. And I listened to the interview several times. Mm-hmm. Kerry Cassidy interviewed him because they're friends, and he's talking about his legal dilemma. And he's been battling the court. Uh, he is very, very, very knowledgeable about the reality of what we've got going on here. And he said he found out that the ju- there's meetings in, he believes there's meetings in Reno every, I can't remember if he said every week or every month, where they get together and they talk about the people who are figuring out the system and are, are managing to get out from under the jurisdiction and they are constantly trying to find ways to prevent that from happening. Okay. Well, so that would make sense because they've got so much at risk if people, you know, get Yeah, they, well, they make money off of these courts. I mean, these courts are for profit. So... Okay, uh, now, uh, before you go further without losing your train of thought, what do you mean by that? Who's making the money and how? 
Now, that gets a little more complex, but um, if you go back to Judge Dale's The Great American Adventure, and I do have some quotes from him. He is a retired judge who wrote a book, The Great American Adventure, and you can get it on our website on um, the store page. You you don't get it from me. You, you would be buying it from a, a, a photocopy company and who would print it up and send it to you if you want that. Or you can get it free, download it, and read it off your computer screen. Uh, there is, and I've seen it, there is a report called the CUSIP report. Each case is assigned a CUSIP number. And it is from this number that money is allocated from the court. Um, it's a little complex I, I suggest people read The Great American Adventure, but in essence, the courts are an arm of the banking system, okay? Mm-hmm. The money that gets paid into the courts, it's transferred to the to the central bank system. Okay, you're talking about for all the fines that people pay for... Even more than that. It's it's even more complex than that, but it is basically a money-making enterprise. Let's just okay. leave it at that. And people want more information, um, I recommend they read The Great American Adventure, which is really quite entertaining to read. It may shock okay. you, but it's, it, it's fairly entertaining. Okay, good. Now, if we wanted to go back with what they're doing in Canada with the smart meters, I looked at their paperwork, Richard. Now, you right. said they've, you've said Wait. they've got some success, which I'm pleased about. They have reported a few cases where they show this notice of liability that they've written up. And I'm trying to get these guys on the show, so we'll see. But they, they show this notice of liability to um, some of the heads of utility companies, for example, uh-huh. and in a couple of cases, a couple of judges, and the utility company people, at least three of them just quit their jobs, and some of the government officials suddenly quit their jobs when they were given the notice of liability or default that follows it. One was a head of a privy council, and not being Canadian, I don't even really know what that is, but it's supposed to be a pretty high official, and, and he just quit, and at least one judge ran out of the courtroom when it came up. Well, I don't, I, I, I can't answer why that would be, um, why a privy council member would be involved in this, because to my knowledge, these meters are being implemented by energy corporations. Okay, so the one at the end of the list who's taking the, the hit is the private for-profit energy corporation. So I was a little confused about that. It might be because they're saying the judge has some personal liability for a law that's not, ju- uh, not you know, legitimate. I yeah, don't know. I, don't, I can't answer that. I don't know what, everything that's transpired. Okay. I do know that I looked at the paperwork, and I, I will say I would not be comfortable implementing that paperwork at all. Mm-hmm. Okay. And here's the one of the reasons if you're going to implement paperwork, that's why I recommend people do some reading. Yeah. Um, read the whole, if you're going to do a notice of condition precedent, which is an accompaniment to the lawfully yours, read the material. If you can't defend what you're doing, if you have no way of defending what you're doing, you will fail. Mm-hmm. And what they've done is really quite complex. I find it hard to believe that they are going to be able to educate a lot of people uh, and teach them how to do this. I find this very difficult to believe because if you've noticed, I've been on your show, I think it's the third time, Mm -hmm. I'm trying to get people to do the notice of condition precedent, which is one little page. It's not complex in my mind, Mm -hmm. but Still, people struggle with it. One little page, and they're struggling with it because it's so alien to everything they've been taught. Well, just take a second and say what it's for. I mean, what kind of what kind of situation would you use your notice of condition precedent precedent in? You can use it. Uh, you can use it for almost anything. Like 
Um, we have a legal notice for smart meter on our in our lawfully yours, uh-huh. and it and it starts out. It's a notice that you send to the to the executives of the utility company. Okay. Okay, and it starts out saying as a flesh and blood living woman, or as a flesh and blood living man. And then you can put C attached, and you can attach that notice of condition preceding, which proves that not only are you declaring yourself in your little notice to the power company, you have actually published this notice to the world, and you've got a copy attached. Okay. See, it's not that you just woke up that morning and said, I'm going to call myself a living flesh and blood man. <laughs> okay. Which you have a right to do, but it's got more power if you say C attached because you used the concept of notice, public notice even, mm-hmm. to reestablish yourself as a living man. And you posted it in a location for 30 days for the whole world to see that you are declaring yourself to the world that you are a living flesh and blood man and you're amending all contracts without prejudice. Now, you've got evidence when you send in your notice of what you're saying when you notify the power company. Our concept was based on the fact that the power companies are all chartered corporations. And no chartered corporations in this country, because it's a business plan, none of them are given statutory permission to harm or injure living men, women, boys, or girls. That's not how the system works. It's all a legal fiction. So they don't even acknowledge there are such a thing in their corporate charter as living men, women, boys, and girls. Okay. So, So, now he is saying, when I looked at his paperwork, you know, I'd love to talk to him. I don't have his number, but I'm having a hard time because he's saying he's, 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 that they're altering the contract that he made with them by insisting on a smart meter. And he's modifying the contract and making a new one, new terms. Now, they don't have to contract with him. That's why I find this very strange. They are not likely to contract hit with him as an individual and give him a whole different contract or agreement. I mean, AEP, who gives the electricity for me, I mean, it covers several states, for goodness sakes. They're not going to write a new contract for each individual. Yeah, well, what he says is they'll either ignore it the way it's written... Yes. Or they will have an attorney write a letter that it's nonsense. Okay, and then where is he? Where is he going to go? He gives them a notice of default and said, "Well, you didn't, you know, uh, respond properly to the counteroffer within this amount of t- time. If you need a little more time, let us know. But if not, you, you're in default, and here are the, you know, terms that we have to deal with now." Okay, and how's he going to enforce the collection? I am waiting to talk to him, but I I would guess that the idea is that if he thinks he has a, a valid legal foundation, that he can get law enforcement to, or or collection agencies or somebody to enforce it and put liens and levies and things on property. Oh, I wish him luck because I have not seen people succeed in that. Yeah, the collection is- issue is really important because even if you're right and it's never collected, it doesn't necessarily matter, right? Well, that's correct. And one one of the things that we've all noticed that is missing in our system is our ability to punish the criminals. The well, criminals, I, the yeah, con- the Constitution is an example because even if you say that something that the, you know, most of the Congress violates their oath to the Constitution in the first five minutes of office, but I don't know anywhere where it says what the penalty for that is. And do you know one court that's going to penalize them? No, I've never heard of anyone even considering that. There, see, there, therein lies the problem, and we've run into that many, many, many times. It's the enforcement, and that's why nowhere in any of the book work that I have put together with the people I work with do we include these liens. Um, 
we have found they what we try to focus on is getting people out from under these onerous rules and re- restrictions and fines and penalties okay. but to get the system to pay us um and and someone to enforce that payment you yeah, have so to go back different. into their court you have to go back into their court mm. now if you go back into their court as a living flesh and blood man, they can't see you, so they're not going to enforce your agreements. They can't do anything with you, right? Theoretically, right. they can't. Because you're anything. out of their jurisdiction. Right. <laughs> so, yeah. I mean... That, I, I, that will be really interesting to see what they say. I actually have an appointment to talk to somebody in their office tomorrow, so I'm going to bring that up and see what they say. Yeah, I mean, that's the the biggest problem in this movement, and I've been... Watching people listening to listening to interviews they've given. I've been reading papers they've written for gosh, almost ten years. And the amount of people who are able to collect on these liens is few and far between. Um, the enforcement, we can find out where they're violating their 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 own rules, but getting a court to uh, enforce them against them to get their court to enforce mm-hmm. their rules against them with these judges is proving to be almost impossible so Remember, the real the, judges can do anything they want they have almost no restrictions yeah 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 exactly and a lot of them are in for a long period of time right that's right that uh, is yeah uh, okay, so so when you're looking at practical application of this whole idea of using UCC, right. it's more of a defensive way yes. of n- not becoming victimized in a way if they're determined to damage you in some way. Correct. Using UCC to protect yourself. Correct. That's exactly right. And you know, you can say to protect yourself, and you can also say to ensure that you're not volunteering into it. Okay, so you have this little summary on your website of um, 10 or 20 pages or something or in a couple of different forms that summarizes the main elements of UCC. Um, if, if somebody studies that instead of the hundreds or thousands of pages that actually make up UCC, is that enough to allow them to start actually using it safely? Yeah, I think that if they would start out really with that one book, Are You Legally Alive or Dead? Okay. That's really about getting people to understand how, as living men and women, they fit into this picture. They have to understand that they are being tricked into being this other entity and don't even know it. And... Starting by reading that would be, in my opinion, a great first step. Okay. Then they can move on to lawful years because we go even further. Then we go in into the the idea of people sending you letters that you owe them money. We go into, you know, what happens when the municipality sends you a letter saying we decided to make everybody put street lights in front of their house. Please mm-hmm. send us five thousand right. dollars. I mean but first you have to, in my opinion, Richard, you have to see where you, as the living man or woman, with the ability to sign their name meaning in contract, meaning you're not underage, you're over 18, you have not been considered insane by the courts, okay? Mm-hmm. That means you're able, and he's got that in his, his paperwork too, that you are legally able to contract. Now, once you get that, and that it's all about contracts, Mm -hmm. then you have something to build from. And the thing about the notice of condition precedent that we promote, and that's explained in that little booklet, is it's all so close to being 100% risk free. That would be good. Yeah, that would be really good. It, because once you post it on our website and you put it in your drawer, that's just your first step. Now, then you can decide when you might want to make copies and use it. And you may choose to use it just to 
dispute whether or not you should license the dog, whether or not um, you're going to accept a traffic ticket or send it back um, with a copy of your notice, which exits you from under their statutory regulations Mm -hmm. or do you want to use it to debate or dispute taxes or um, whatever you want to use it for okay Mm -hmm. you decide whether or not you feel you want to whether or not you feel you can defend it whether or not um, it's too scary whatever you choose to do Processing it for 30 days is risk-free. Then when you get ready to use it, most likely the worst thing they're going to do is not respond to it. Yeah, yeah. It's in not fact, an act that's, that's of That's what Cal and Josh are noticing, too, is that most of the time nobody responds. Exactly, because what they did is they brought themselves out from under the corporate fiction and they put themselves back into being living men now, the minute you do that, they really can't see you. Their corporate courts can't see you. I yeah, mean, they, they've they also gotten some letters from city and county and state attorneys saying, there's no legal basis for this. It's all nonsense. Yeah, they would do that. They, they would do that. That's what they do with me. There's no legal basis. In fact, I, I mean, if you look at are you legally alive or dead, you will see that the information I provided, factual information, real legal definitions, no, I didn't make anything up regarding the word person, okay, Mm -hmm. is indisputable. I mean, you cannot dispute it. I got the definitions from the statutes, state Mm -hmm. statutes from the federal registry that regulates all the agencies, and from the Uniform Commercial Code. That's your legal system right there. I quoted all of them and their definition of the word person. So those definitions of the words in the language are all within the universal um, uh, commercial code, right? Yeah. And that's where when the lawyer says this is nonsense, what happens is the, the living flesh and blood man who are listening to this debate or dispute between me and the bar attorney, they're not actually listening to me. They're listening to the expert, they think. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, right. So that's how easy it is for these lawyers. They just stand up and say, well, she's not a lawyer. She doesn't know what she's talking about. Yeah, exactly. And so most juries would assume that somebody like that would be the authority that would be right. Well, I, I don't know about, you know, again, we're trying to keep you out of court, but when I try to talk to people and, and share this idea, so often, and, and I, this you know, this seems to be human nature, Richard, because when I first told my husband about fluoride, okay, mm-hmm. he, he was a physician, and when I first told him about it, he, he was a retired physician, yeah. but he'd been taught one thing his whole life. Right? Right. All doctors believe that. Yeah. So I started researching fluoride, and I had a folder that was just mountainous. And I took my time, and I went through these documents, and I, you know, this is a toxicologist, and this is a dentist from Canada, and all of this slowly but surely. Mm -hmm. He was so, he thought was so incredulous that he went and asked his dentist. That's interesting. Okay. And I'm his wife. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And the dentist says, oh, no, it's fine. It's good for your teeth. Yeah, exactly. So, what you said about our choice of experts, that is how they're controlling us. Right. Um, if, you, if you think you can't learn anything about the law except through a lawyer, you will never get off dead center. You will be stuck into their system ad nauseum. You'll never get out. Yeah. Well, you've given us one, two, three, four, five, six, at least six or eight different sources to read right now as a start. And yes. I feel like it's important to do that because, you know, we we don't have to use it if we don't have to use it. But if it comes up that we're in a situation like that, it may be better than just going along with what you're told to do. 
Yes, and you can use it on something that's not real scary. Right. <laughs> you know? Right. Um, fighting the IRS. Now, that is a big battle. That's mm-hmm. a huge battle. I've known people who've been doing it for 20 years. Right, right. That's a, you, You're going to be taking on a big, big battle. Fighting whether or not y- your dog is licensed. Now, that might be something people could be more comfortable with. Right, and and you said that some of those, um, you have the, the UCC general provisions on your site also, right? Correct. Now, let me read you just really quickly, and I don't know, I, I think that Cal Washington understands this, but I got the amount of reference he made to the U.S. Constitution. I did not get the sense that he knows about the Senate Report 93549. I did not get the sense that he is aware of the fact that the United States has been in an emergency, state of national emergency, since 1933. You really have to understand that because he keeps referring to the Constitution. And the Constitution, in, for all intents and purposes, has been suspended. And again, it's not my opinion. There was a report that came out in 1973, very thorough, very, very thorough report done by a Senate committee on the permanent state of national emergency, and they explain it all brilliantly. It's easy to understand. That's on your site also? Yes. So what, is it, what is it called? Is it the Senate Report 93549? Uh-huh. And if okay. you go to the source document page, I have... Several versions of it. I have one which is a copy of the original text. I have one that is a copy of a text that is easier to read. It was just duplicated. Same thing. Then I have one that is just an excerpts page, and it's front and back, and it just gives you important excerpts. So if you want to know what's in it, you can just go to the excerpts and read that. But I wanted to mention to everybody, if you look at our legal system... We've got the regulatory, what are the laws? The laws are coming from um, our municipalities, those who we elect, our legislators, those who we elect. And then there are rules and regulations coming from the agency network. Okay, those are not who we elect. Those are de facto laws that they're enforcing with their own firearms, right? Yeah, that would be like BLM. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Yeah, so FDA you say, and people like that. Right. So you say, well, who is who is reigning all these rules on us, you know? And you've got two groups. One are the electees, elected ones, and the other are the agency appointed ones. Which are now, by far the majority of the laws are coming as agency rules, right? Okay. So now the the federal agencies and all, all the state agencies seem to be networks of the federal agency. Their rules are in something called the Federal Register, and that act was passed in 1935. So you say to yourself, okay, why do I care? Well, you care because you want to know how they define a person. Remember, these they're giving grants to the state, and they want the state to enforce their rules via the grant. So the state and the federal grant people, they have to agree on these definitions, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so they're all enforcing on the same population. Okay, so your federal... Well, and, so, and supposedly the agencies exist because of delegated powers from the state and federal governments. That's correct. Okay, so now we got the agency network who are imposing rules and regulations, and then we've got those that we supposedly elect who are doing the same thing. That's two mm-hmm. groups. So I want to give you a short example of both groups. Yeah. Anything in the federal agency network, and there are six, some 600 agencies now. Yeah. Okay. They They're have all, to do. All keeping us safe and healthy and everything, yes. unfortunately. Yeah. That would include the Department of Homeland Security. Right. Okay. So they are obligated under something called the Federal Register Act. That's when we started the Federal Registry, where these agencies are registered and all their you rules said that are. That started in 73. 35, 1935, during the national emergency. Remember, Roosevelt brought in the national emergency. He needed agencies to help him manage it. So that was the Federal Regi- Registry Act. Okay, so let's go back and what? how do they define a person, right? 
A person means an individual, a partnership, association, or corporation. Now, how many of those are alive? Read that list again one more time. Person means an individual, partnership, association, or corporation. Well, I mean, most people think that they're individuals, I guess. Okay, so you're suspecting that one of them is alive. It sounds similar to the English word that we use to dif- refer to each other as individuals. Okay. Yeah. Okay, but now think about this. How could the same rule for an association or a partnership apply to an individual human by the name of Richard? I don't know. I mean, people just assume it has to because the government said so. <laughs> it's written down right there. You just read it. Yeah, correct. So, an inv- individual is not a living man. Okay. Is individual must, defined anywhere? It must be. I would yes, think. it is. But uh, w- let's go back. What we've got, when you've got four things, three of them are not living. And mm-hmm. they're all grouped together. Mm-hmm. You have to say that they're all connected and that you've got four artificially created legal entities is what they all are. Okay. Okay, that's what they all are. And you can't define, let's go on to, okay, that's the federal. Now, what happens in California in the state statutes? Okay, you're going to like this one. In California, a person includes any person firm Association, organization, partnership, limited liability, company, business, trust, corporation, or company. Hmm, That's nine artificially created legal entities. Not one is alive. Right, right. You cannot define the word person with the word person. Yeah, you're not giving much new information that way, huh? (laughs) It's not a definition, is it? Right. Okay, let's go to Ohio. So, we got statutes going on all the time in Ohio. What does Ohio say a person is? Ohio says a person includes an individual, a corporation, a business trust, estate, trust, partnership, and association. That's seven artificially created legal legal entities, and not one is a living, breathing human being. Right. So... Now we go on to see uh, how do these compare to the Uniform Commercial Code. We looked at the Federal Registry, which governs all those agencies. We looked at the statutes for Ohio and California. We took two examples. We see they're, they're almost identical. So how does this all line up with the UCC? Well, under UCC, a person is defined this way. Person means an individual, corporation, business, trust, estate, trust, partnership, limited liability, company, association, joint venture, government, governmental subdivision, agencies or instrumentality, public corporation or any other legal or commercial entity. Wow. That doesn't, oh, doesn't sound very human. 14 artificially created legal entities and that's what people have to understand they are not making these things for living flesh and blood men and women unless you agree to be that legal corporate entity and sadly because it's such a it's such a deception most of us don't even see it right so, now, the very can, first thing in any proceeding is to get you to agree that you're a company. Exactly. Okay. Or you're going to be there on behalf of the company. They got your body. So, if you're going to sign your name and be here, there on half, behalf of the company, then when they're done sent- sentencing you, then they get the bailiff just to snag your little body and throw it in jail. Okay, because you're speaking for the company. Yes, and you agreed to. Yeah, Okay. Okay, okay. Yeah, nobody has any idea what they're even talking about. No, and this is the thing. What I just read, you would think that lawyers would have a difficult time denying that. Yeah, but they're victims of higher education, even though it's specifically in the legal school, and they've been taught not to think, but just to memorize and then think that they learned something. 
Well, and I think, I think that if they question what they memorized and say, wait a minute, why is any of this? Then, you know, they, they would have a hard time getting successfully through school. And my friend said they're taught a procedure. They're not taught the law. Right. right which I exactly. thought was an interesting point of view. He said they're, they're taught about the procedures. Yeah. And the yeah. rules, they're not taught really what the law is all about. They're also taught precedents. Right. As if every time there's a decision in court, that's basically a new law. Yes. So I don't know where Cal's thing is going to go. Uh, he did bring himself back to life. You know, they, they, they signed in there as a living man and woman. He did name the officers of these companies, mm-hmm. which by name, by, by their title and their living name, that's right. all good. Um, but I don't know how far this is going to go. I could see where it might scare them if they believe there's a liability because he's identifying them by name. Mm-hmm. I could see where that would make them uncomfortable. It would depend on what the lawyers in these different um, jurisdictions are telling them. I could see where they would be uncomfortable. Now you've got my name attached to it and you know my name and I don't want to be... And maybe by putting all that information in there, which he put quite a bit, showing the problems with smart meters... Yeah, exactly. So they can't deny that they're trying to cause harm. Yes, because it's possible they don't even know about all these problems. Remember how... That's true. It is possible. Yeah, these people are so compartmentalized. That could be their first actual look at the reality of smart meters because you know the AEP and these other electric companies are telling all these people, oh, no. That is fine. Yeah. It's fine. Yeah, that that came up when I was at the hearing recently at the city about the 5G system that they they the city uh council members really wanted to know that it was safe and so they hired a telecom industry consultant to ask. And they <laughs> and he came in there and only charged I don't know a few thousand dollars or something to give them an honest answer and said, "Yeah, absolutely, they're all completely safe." And so that was it. They weren't interested in any other data. Oh, wow. I hope you got his name. Mm, I'll have to check and see. But he was, you know, wore really nice clothes. He was, he was doing what yeah, he was obvi- I, obviously had to be telling the truth. Yeah, I mean, I would look to communicate with him and hold him liable. I mean, yeah, I would, true, because based on his testimony, people are being that's right. all over the place. That's, that's true. right. And if that might be an application calls, for something like what Kel's trying to do. Uh, and, and I would say um, you need a copy of his statement where he makes this claim, this false claim. Yeah. The Freedom of Information Act could get you that from the city. We'd like a copy of the statement of this individual. Mm-hmm. Now you've got a copy of his false claim on paper. Yeah. Well, he may be citing some of the scientific papers that have been written about how it's completely safe, paid for by the industry. I haven't uh, seen, and I looked at, I don't think there are. The reason I say that, I looked at the evidence that Cal put in his packet, um, uh and he seemed to have come to the same conclusion that I did, is that they're not making claims that it's safe. They're making claims that there's no evidence that it's not. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That it's still un- unknown. More research is needed and stuff. Correct. Like so if he's gone way out on a limb by himself to tell these people this is safe, uh, that is. Um, that I'm, would be interesting. Yeah, I think what I think what they're doing too. Now I know I heard this part is that. In Arizona, where I am, they're saying the state has made a, has referred to a federal law, which is just the rule from an agency, I think, that you can't look at the health issues connected with 5G. It's not legal. <laughs> they said that in, in the hearing. <laughs> Doesn't anybody have a problem with that? No, it was all fine. 
one of the, one of the council members looked a little bit frustrated and disappointed, but said, "The state has made a uh, referred to this law that we can't bring up health issues. So unfortunately, we it doesn't matter what it does to us." Okay, now here's the key. That's where you can back off and regroup. They work for that corporation. They are obligated under the rules of that corporation. You are not. So your group needs to sit back and think about this because if you stop being a United States citizen, you declare yourself alive, these restrictions don't apply to you. Yeah, well, the other thing is they can't rule out everything because it would take forever. So what they have not specified is that you can still question the safety of it. That's wide open. And some other things like that. They just ruled out health, thinking that that would stop everybody. But there's yeah, a lot and, of other bases. And in, in the notice that we have in Lawfully Yours, the first thing we do is we, we make the statement, safety issues. We have a whole section on safety issues. And we make the statement that no one is in down verifying that this is safe. We put that right in our notice. There are no verifications from the federal corporation that this is safe. None. They aren't giving any. Mm -hmm. Okay, then secondly, we quote the Bioinitiative 2012 and say, however, there are peer-reviewed documents that verify the dangers. Okay? Okay. So we put that right in there. He is kind of vague. All he says is there's there's professional papers that say they're dangerous. Well, in our notice, we we cite a specific one that is quite recognizable. And when you look at who put that together, that's not just nothing. <laughs> those are those are really amazing scientists who put that together. So then we go on to say, since you're not saying it's safe. Since we've got this report saying it can cause harm and injury, you, executive officers for the American Electric Power, we're going to hold you personally liability for any harm or injury that will come to us. Yeah, I think that's totally reasonable. Yeah. And if, if they become aware that there's a huge harm that's going to happen from it, that may have an impact. And I think that's what, what the uh, other guys are working on, too. I think they're working in the same direction. Mm-hmm. We'll see how far that gets. I do I do have to tell you, Richard, if you look at their paperwork, uh, you can let me know what you think. I think it looks far more complex than most people will be able to handle. Yeah, I thought so, too. Did you? you know, I, I'm going to ask him about that. I mean, it's got everything from legal notices to passages from the Bible and everything in between. Yeah. And it's not... Uh, you know, it's, it's talking about a whole different paradigm of understanding than most people are aware of. So, one of their main challenges, I think, to get it anywhere is that it has to be able to disseminate very fast and be usable effectively without the main guy's leadership so that they don't feel like they can shut it down by eliminating one person. Yeah, and these people, if this thing would take off, they cannot go and hold hands all across Canada and all across the United States to get this done. They don't simply, there's no way they would have the time to do that. I mean, this is this would be out of control in, in, in no time. Um, yeah, and not just for smart meters. I mean, if this can is as valid as they think, right. then it could be used on vaccines and chemtrails and nuclear power plants and all kinds of stuff. Well, that's why I, I recommend people look at the approach that a group of us took in Lawfully Yours, which is okay. a different approach. We're using one-page notices. They're not we, we keep them as, as clean as we can, understanding that the more you put in, the more complicated it is, the more difficult it is. Right. And the other thing is, I would not want to go into any courtroom and argue the Bible. It's all UCC. I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I yeah. mean, you've well, got to be I, able to defend it, and if you can't defend it, then yeah, you, you know what? What this is going to come down to is experience, and what is going to work and what isn't. And I think you know, right now, notes are being compared between theories 
But what's really needed is notes being compared between results. Right. And then, then it can be fine-tuned. And so, I think the, the, the key is still going to be, and we all have to remind everybody, that the judge in each courtroom has so much latitude that while we all yeah. want to find a methodology that will work every time in every courtroom, right? it's extremely unlikely that we're going to accomplish that goal. Because right. of the latitude they have. But our paperwork will also go in front of all these bar attorneys. And when they start to see the mess and the dangers that is coming from this legal structure. Yeah, that would be really valuable if you get a large number of attorneys defecting from the system. Then you would say, oh my gosh, look at, we've now got attorneys who see the problem. Yeah, they now could be they're going valuable. to challenge this system. Right. And it would be their input, in my opinion, that, would, that could actually bring an end to it, is if they actually start to read our paperwork, they're going to see where the problem yeah. is. They have to be brave enough to risk their licenses because the licenses are, are intended primarily to prevent them from considering things like this. The, the other problem is like the, with the vaccines, we have a vaccine notice. When a lawyer reads that vaccine notice, he will be getting potentially, and the same way with the smart meter notice, they will be given potentially for the first time in their life the truth. What's that notice called on your site so people can get it? Lawfully Yours has got quite a few notices in there. There's one for vaccines. There's one for smart meters. Okay. There's one for doctors. There's one for schools. Um, the, the whole, the concept is the same, that you're giving a notice that will end up in the hands of an attorney, and we're putting references and documents in those notices that, may very well wake them up because their children are being vaccinated. Uh, yeah, exactly, exactly. And they're being told when it, when, it, when it damages or kills them, they're being told that there's no connection. That's right. They're, they're going to have smart meters on their houses. Yeah. Once it finally goes off in their head that they are perpetuating a system which is causing them personal harm. Right. I think, uh, depending on how many of them get it and how many of them just realize that there's no way out for them either unless the system is, is deconstructed. Yeah, yeah, that's very hopeful, actually. Yes. Um, why, don't, why don't we end by just letting people know, I think the bottom line here is just not to, you know, we're not recommending any kind of action specifically for anybody other than to become educated and since we have mostly missed our education since we've been wrapped up in the school system as it exists now this is one area that would be good to know about for whatever cases in the future that you might need it for yeah. you know it's right a anything that you want people to remember from this whole long discussion and then if possible Maybe next time you're back, we could talk about the elements of UCC. Yes, uh, uh, I would love. I would love all the listeners. It's not a hard book to read. It's short to read. Uh, Are you legally alive or dead? It's free, um, and if they read that, I think it might be the briefest, least complicated way to introduce them into the fact that we've got this duality when it comes to the legal system. And they really do need to understand that if they're going to protect the, themselves and their, and their loved ones, um, because until they do, they will continue continually volunteer to do things that are harming and injuring them. Right, right. Um, one quick thing, and I, I know we're, we're out of time, we need to wrap up, but for the people that live in California and other states that may follow in its footsteps with respect to forced vaccines for children uh, and the fact that nobody's liable if it kills your child, um, if, if people had read all of the things here 
how would that change their situation with respect to their kid having to show up proving how to vaccines for school? I, I've recommended the, the legal notice for the people in California. They need to do that. Okay. Now, they can start by doing the notice of condition precedent because the first thing on that one page, if you put that notice, that and that's all explained in that little booklet that I, that I keep recommending. Okay. When you get your notice of condition precedent processed, you're going to reclaim the ownership of your child. Right That's now, true. right now, in their world, the state perceives that they own our children. Right. Yeah, that's clear. Thank and you. you have to, you have to reclaim, rebut the presumption, saying no. Um, by nature of the birth certificate, I do not grant you the authority to own this child. I rebut that presumption. Right, and that get, that's that's gotten into in the first book, the one that says, "Are you alive or dead?" Yes. Okay. It's okay. all in there, and that should be a, a really good maybe starter. I hope yeah. I didn't confuse people, Richard. But um, you know, nobody wants to learn about the law. It's not that much fun. But at the same time, not knowing it can cause us great harm. You know. Right. Right. Yeah. There. I mean. Living in a situation like like we do right now, just it takes extra work to educate yourself, and you just have to budget your time so that you you know take care of the things that are important. And this is unfortunately one of them. Based on what's going on now, I'm going to add it to the th- my homework too and see what I can get, and then hopefully you'll come back and get into UCC some more in some more detail. Okay, well, thank you so much. I'm glad you uh, gave me this opportunity. I hope people find this information helpful. Yeah, it was great. Anticorruptionsociety.com and also the information is on the site about all the archives for the radio show, right? Yes. Okay, sounds great. Hold on and we'll say goodbye in the break here. Okay. All right, there goes Elle Whitney. Uh, Her site, remember, where all the educational material that she referred to is the videos and the things to read and a lot of free stuff. AnticorruptionSociety.com, A-N-T-I-C-O-R-R-U-P-T-I-O-N Society.com. Uh, I'm going to add that to my homework. There's lots of great educational material there that I think is important. And there is no instruction from us or her to you to do anything with any of this stuff because there's risk involved. And if you don't do it right, and people have even done it right and had bad things happen, but in an environment where we're subject to attack by various authority figures under color of law, which is happening all the time, or from big corporations or any kind of corporations, then it's better to have an awareness of the law that they're actually using, which according to what Al and other people have been teaching is UCC law, And an introduction to that is on her site, so I just think it's good educational material, and I'm going to read all of what she recommended as soon as I possibly can. Also, um, we're going to, and we can talk about it too on the radio later on if you want to, uh, on the Saturday show where we have call in uh, uh, options after I talk for a little while, and and I invite all of you to come there and participate if you want. That's Saturday at uh, blogtalkradio.com slash law starts radio six o'clock pacific time nine o'clock eastern u.s time and that's on saturday nights as opposed to these guest shows which are on sunday as you know if you're a regular listener of course and also we'll we'll see what happens with the in power movement that we were talking about with al that's uh, www.inpowermovement.com and to me i See, I don't think that I, I know a certain amount about the global rulers and their power structure. I don't think they're just going to say, rats, we lost, you guys won the legal battle. No. I mean, it, if, if we're fortunate, the proper uses of notice of liability and all other aspects of UCC law will, will possibly buy time. Because as Josh and Kel have found out, they've had some officials resign and some really good things happen when people were using these notices, ultimately, the power structure is being run from malevolent forces that don't intend to stop. But I think that's where the 
priority of the inner work comes in because that's where the real power is. And this is just my opinion. You're free to reject it, as always, if it doesn't feel right to you. But in my experience, this is where our real potential uh, option is to reverse this whole destroy the world thing that's happening around us uh, with our own power that doesn't require any technology, doesn't require any legal work, doesn't require anything. And it doesn't mean you stop the other stuff you're doing. You can still work with the Empower Movement, which looks really good. And I had a long discussion with them earlier today, too, and, and maybe helping them in some way, which will be kind of exciting. I think they have a lot of good ideas and tools. But ultimately, no matter how good of a cause you're working on, whether it's with some kind of a legal instrument like they're talking about or to get organic agriculture back or stop geoengineering or whatever, the degree to which that can be effective in the long run is highly connected to your degree of connected, um, to your being connected to your source internally. And so our inner work, in my opinion, is first and simultaneous with all the others if we're serious about getting the best results that we need to get. And the ultimate solution is not in any of these good things that we're doing on the outside, and they they won't stop. We, we won't stop doing that, but the, the bad guys aren't going to stop because of that either. And, however, there's no defense that they have available at all against our conscious reconnection internally to the abilities that we used to have. And that's why we started the Saturday show, is that you know we want this whole situation turned around and the babies being born now and the generations that are, want to come afterwards they need a better place to live that's not in as much chaos as the current world situation and we have an opportunity to be part of that solution and, and you don't have to be working on any high profile project because the whole idea of this inner work and the power that goes with it is that you can be cleaning a bathroom, digging a ditch, being president of the United States, or working for a corporation. Whatever you're doing in your daily world and responsibilities, if you're doing this inner work, you can become one of the primary forces to heal this planet. You don't have to have anybody know about you. It doesn't matter what station in life you are, whether you have money, what religion you are, any of that stuff. It matters what you're doing, what you're really doing internally. So the physical steps that we talk about on the Saturday show from the great real health teachers that can turn around virtually any health condition that you're dealing with, those are the first part. That's not the ultimate goal, although it's great in itself, but that that is to make it more comfortable and feasible and possible for you to do the real work and to make that easier. So if you're interested in that at all, you're well, you're in personally invited to join us. I see you as, each one of you is the most important person in the world and with massive potential that why should we wait till we're dying to realize what we could have done during our lifetime? Why don't we make believe we already had that experience wished we would have realized it, asked for the opportunity to go back and try it again, that opportunity was granted out of incredible grace and generosity, and here we are. So are we going to forget again, or are we going to do it this time? So if you are interested in finding out and practicing and working on that with us, join us on Saturday. And what we start with is that healing the world which a lot of us want to do, requires healing yourself first and simultaneous and that they're not disconnected, not unrelated. So you can do it with us if you want to. Just, you know, be a regular person with good motive to help yourself and help everybody else and you're really invited, you know, in the strongest possible terms. And in the meantime, because today is Sunday and... Um, that show is not till Saturday. So during the week, if you want to get up to speed on what we've already been talking about, all the archives of the shows, every one of them back to the beginning, is available free, no money required, on lostartsradio.com. 
www.lostartsradio.com and if you sign up for the newsletter there which is also free then you'll get advanced information about future shows other things that I want to share with you there's also a free forum there where you can talk about any of this stuff or what's come up in your life or your mind and you want to share with anybody or get their feedback that forum is free on lostartsradio.com there's also a new Facebook group that started and I'm interacting with it as well it's on Facebook for Lost Arts Radio and then if you have money please donate because we're you know we're barely holding things together here and it would be nice if people with the resources that, who are not struggling for their own survival because if they are please don't donate anything take care of yourself first but if you have the funds please help us out because it'll keep us going that all goes to the um, Lost Arts Research Institute nonprofit which ultimately I hope will be in a position to build a school probably in Arizona which from which we'll demonstrate and teach these things that we're just talking about on the radio. We're going to let people experience it and demonstrate it in real time and hopefully have an even bigger impact on the world. And in the meantime, until we have the money and the resources to do that, we're going to do everything we can through this show and the Saturday show. And uh, for education on the Sunday night show and then talking about real world application on the Saturday night show and I, I'm very grateful to you personally just talking to you not the whole audience just you for caring about this stuff and about yourself and realizing that it's never a choice between taking care of yourself and helping others because if you want to help others you cannot do it fully without really taking care of yourself getting to the root of everything that is holding you back, physical problems, emotional barriers, everything, taking care of that in yourself, first priority. And that allows you to be of vastly more help to everybody else from your family to the friends of yours and people you know and the whole world. It all depends on what you do inside yourself, 100%. And if you want to help yourself, you can't do that without getting rid of all malice toward everybody. Bad guys, good guys, whatever. And this is uh, part of the deeper meaning hidden in the idea of loving your enemies. It's not pretending that you like what they're doing. That would be dishonest. It's sending out healing wishes to them instead of wishes for their destruction. And if we do that toward everybody, it turns around instantaneously and comes back on you which even helps your physical health and makes that get healed faster. It all works together in this beautifully orchestrated system that is way beyond what the mind can imagine. So um, I have to wait to meet you back here until next Saturday, but in the meantime, listen to the free archives if you want to and if you have time. Work on some things that will help you during the week. Have a really good time during the week and I'll hope everything goes really well for you in all aspects of your life. And I'll meet you back here next Saturday. Talk to you then. Listen to our new shows with guests every Sunday night at 9 p.m. Eastern, 6 p.m. Pacific. All new shows and archives are available at blogtalkradio.com forward slash lost arts radio. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash lost arts radio. We're on Twitter at Lost Arts Radio. Our YouTube channel is youtube.com forward slash the letter C slash Lost Arts Radio. Again, youtube.com slash C slash Lost Arts Radio. And scene.life, we're at Lost Arts Radio forward slash profile. When you do your Amazon shopping, please use Amazon Smile program at smile.amazon.com. And when you choose Lost Arts Research Institute, in Sedona, Arizona as your charity, Amazon will donate half a percent of whatever your order total is to Lost Arts Research Institute to help fund the building of the school and keep our radio show on the air. Please visit lostartsresearchinstitute.org for more information on the school we want to build. Be sure to sign up for our free weekly newsletter on our site under the radio show tab or right from the button on our Facebook page. You're also invited to join our free user forum on our website at lostartsradio.com. You can ask Richard a question there or post about any subject that you're interested in. Our forum is growing and we'd love to have you be part of that community. 
We keep it troll free, so don't worry about others, paid or otherwise, speaking negatively or engaging in some sort of debunking tactic fakery. I closely monitor the forum for abuse, and we have a very strict one strike and you're out policy, which is why we require you to register your email address along with whatever screen name or username you want to use. We also have links to all of the great independent musicians whose music we feature each week on Lost Arts Radio. And if you like Lost Arts Radio, please consider donating a few bucks to help keep us on the air. We spend many, many hours each week to bring you the best show we can with the best guests around. You can find our donate button on our website at lostartsradio.com. Contact Richard at richard at lostartsradio.com or myself, Doug Diamond, at Doug at LostArtsRadio.com. Thanks again for listening to Lost Arts Radio, and we'll see you again next week. Living in America used to be a dream For so many people far away and unseen With their big cars Tell you to reach for anything you want But everything is possible Just believe that you can Cause we're God's chosen children Living in America With our long hugs and my picket fences Living in America Was a dream Now they Deliver all that people back to the kingdom Better not try to stop us all getting our way Cause we have what it takes to change the world Follows us everywhere Cause they've lost their voice They've lost their way And feel safe in our shadow Now it's all gone The glory days Living in America In our high rise 